Revelation 17. If you would stand, if you, this is a little bit of a long passage, if you feel comfortable. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of, of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carry her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go into destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has yet has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to seven and goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are, re they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords, the king of kings, and those with him are called, are the called, are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are, wa are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw there, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn a her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal authority or power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. And God's people said, Amen. And you may be seated. Let's again ask the Lord's direction. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your word. You've already pronounced a blessing on those who read and hear and obey. And Lord, may you truly benefit us by your word. Help us to seek what you're saying, not to impose on the text our ideas, and then live accordingly. For your name's sake, we ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing is certain is the lunacy that we see in our world today. I mean, that's, you know, you, we used to have the thing, well, I can't, be, I can't be surprised, and we're surprised, and it just seems more and more idiotic, foolish, and senseless, doesn't it mean, doesn't it seem to be senseless? And you wonder why. Well, essentially, ideas have consequences. Now, you, have, you know, that most people don't even think, and people think they think, and people would rather die than think, but generally speaking, people are just like, kind of, I say this, like dumb animals. They're just going along with culture that they're in. Okay? They don't think, they don't propose, they, they just go along. But what has happened is that mankind in his thinking has always desired to separate itself from God. And over the centuries and millennium, they have worked and labored and, 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 and tried to come up with rationale and reason. And now, now in the 20th century and the 21st century, man in his thinking 
believes that they have finally come up with a way to expunge God out of um, thinking, out of society, out of living. Right now, if you talk to anybody, the movers and shakers, whether it's in academia or in, in, in uh, government or in entertainment, whatever it is, you talk to people, essentially the, the great sigh of relief is that God doesn't exist. And in God's place is science. In God's place, essentially, is this billions and billions and billions of years of chance, of happenstance, that produces and then destroys everything. And the bottom line, and they'll say this out, the bottom line with this understanding is that life absolutely has no meaning. No purpose, no direction. No they call, you know, used to be called a meta-narrative. There's, there's no our overarching storyline. It's just utterly meaningless. And what life consists now for people is to play a game, to construct by your choices a life that you think appears to be meaningful when in fact it isn't. It is absurd fiction. And it's having its telltale effects on society. If you're being bombarded by television and by our um, educators and by our legislators that essentially God is out of the picture and there is no direction to anything, how is that going to affect your living? There is no purpose. There is no meaning. When... They said this. I can't remember. It was on a bumper. Essentially, there's no difference between the life of a cockroach and the life of a person. Isn't it absurd? And it gets, you know, and, and you think it's, it's going to keep getting more and more absurd. But the problem with that is that kind of life, that kind of mindset is actually suicidal. And our society is committing suicide in a sense. Now, contrast that with the Bible. The Bible is God if you will, for us, giving us the flow of history. It is. God is laying out for us a straight line, if you will, of chronology of man. He's telling us where we began. He's telling us what took place in the middle and where everything is going to conclude, and he is the concluder of all things. Now, you have these two worldviews, these two concepts. One, that I decide for myself what my illusionary reality and purpose is. And that's why you simply say nowadays the big thing is determining your own gender. I was listening on the radio, and this woman was just so upset because her kids would go to school, little school. And, and, and the teacher would say to their, her boys, are you still boys today? Isn't that mind-boggling? There was another, there, there, it was, a, it was a, one of these public school meetings, and this woman had gone to this elementary school, pulled out these books, and began to read them. These books were accessible to the kids in the elementary school, and she began to read them at the, at the uh, school board meeting, and they said, stop, children are present. It was so pornographic and disgusting. I mean, it's absurd, and that's essentially what it is. You just, life is whatever you make it to be, and by the way, it means nothing anyhow. The Bible is totally contrary to that. It tells us the meta narrative. it tells us the story, it gives us the clear and direct path where everything is going versus the make-believers and the fabricators of fiction today. Now, it's important for us to see what God's saying because what happens is this. The world wants to suffocate any and all people that present the other, the other side. I mean, think, why in the world do, do, well, like Canada, for example, why in the world make legislation criminalizing a person who says homosexual, homosexuality is a sin? What's the big deal? Who cares? Doesn't make any difference. But... They're coming after us. They're coming after people who have a sense of God's history. And, and we see that. The book of Revelation is, as I said, the unfolding of the history of God. 
And one of the things that happens is this, this conflict, which is age old. It goes all the way back to Genesis. Why did Abel, I mean, excuse me, Cain kill Abel? What does it say? Because his, his deeds were righteous. In other words, Cain killed Abel because he reminded him of God. We're, it's coming our way, and it's, it's, it's intensifying and, and becoming harsher and harsher. But one of the things that God has done is to give us as a great encouragement the great flow of history. The book of Revelation was originally written to seven churches who were coming under pressure. Some of it was external pressure, some of it was internal pressures, all sorts of pressure. And pressure and temptation and afflictions are simply this, as Satan's attack to cause you to doubt your faith in Christ. And you know, when, when all of a sudden you're in prison and you're going to have your head removed, that kind of a question, isn't it? Or when... And another way, like the church of Laodicea, everything goes so well, you're op opulent and you have everything. Well, then why do I need Christ? There's pressures of every sort, and it would intensify. But the book of Revelation is for all believers in all ages to show us what's taking place. In order that, regardless of the shape or the form or the flavor of the pressure that is being exerted on us, we will not walk away from Christ, but rather we will stand and shine for him. It's absolutely important that we understand this because we have to be able to withstand the tsunami of this world's persecution. And how do we do that? Let me give you an illustration for basketball game, okay? Imagine you're going to, everybody's familiar with basketball, uh, imagine you're going to play a team and this team is notorious for being cheats who seek to win by inflicting harm on their opponents. Now, that's not the way you're supposed to play basketball, is it? But it's like that. And they're, they're, they're not at all ashamed. This is their reputation. So you go and you play the first quarter. And by the end of the first quarter, you're down by 15 points. And they're not calling fouls on the other team, they're calling fouls on you, and your best player now has been benched because he's in foul trouble. Pooh, that's not looking good. Second quarter, you're now down by 30. Three of your players have been injured by hard fouls and can hardly walk. You go into halftime, what kind of speech do you give? At the end of the fourth quarter, you're now down by 42 points. Your whole starting five have been taken out either by fouling out or by being, in, or by being injured. And your opponent decides to put a full court press on. Fourth quarter, what's your mindset? How would you feel? You're down by 42 points. All of your star players are gone. All you're dealing with is your bench. And these people, your opponents, who have decimated your team, are now putting a full court press on. What would you want to do? <laughs> exactly. Pack it up and go home. That's understandable, isn't it? You know, in, 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 in high school now, they have a mercy rule. And basically, it's a running clock after, was it 30 points or 20-point lead in the fourth quarter? They just, because, you know, this, this is really, really bad. I, you know, football, they don't have that. I was just listening on the radio yesterday. There was a, was it in Indiana? There was a... I think it was Indiana, there was a team that scored 80 points against another team. 80 points. This is not a basketball game, it's a football game. That's a, you know. Now, change the scenario. Suppose, and I don't know how in the world, you, but suppose you, could, you, you, you got a time machine, you looked up into the future, and you saw, in double overtime, a guy that sat on the bench who could hardly walk and chew gum at the same time, shot a three-pointer with no time running, with almost, you know, time running out, made the basket, and you won in double overtime. Now, you know that absolutely, certainly, without doubt. Would that in any way affect how you played the fourth quarter in falling? Would it? 
Oh, absolutely, wouldn't it? Without that knowledge of the future, end and when, you'd be utterly discouraged, wouldn't you? You'd say, there's no hope. These people not, are not only taller than us, they're cheating, and they will think it's funny. But if you know without any doubt, with absolute certainty, that in double overtime, you're going to win, wouldn't it be kind of fun? You're down by 42 points, and, and you start chipping away. And, and it's not like you chip away with the idea that at the end you know you might not make it. But you're chipping away. You're doing this, and everything's just slowly but progressively turning out. Your ultimate win would affect your present play, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Well, you'd go up the foul line with confidence, wouldn't you? You'd play with a, with, a, with a certainty about the outcome. You may not be in the game, but you know who wins. Now, the book of Revelation and God's history is like that. He deliberately and purposely shows us the end so that we might play the game in light of the win, even when our opponent is satanic and his cheating is unlike anybody else's. We're going to look at <clears throat> the great prostitute. And it says of this great prostitute <clears throat> that her, one of her favorite beverages to drink that she gets intoxicated with are the blood of the saints. I mean, you think, what? I mean, this, this, this picture is, is of this person, this being, this, this, this prostitute just imbibing on the blood of the saints. And that, that's a gross picture. And it's not like, oh, this is nasty, but it'll give me another one, give me another one, give me another one. I mean, you look at the book of Revelation and all the wars and all the, the, the harassment and the attack of Satan on God's people, it looks like we're down by 42 points in the last quarter. But you know what God says to us? Let me show you how this whole thing ends. And it's purposeful. Because by realizing how it ends, and who wins, and how he wins, we play differently today. That's the book of Revelation, one of its purposes. So that we understand how to play, or how to live life today purposely. Now, Revelation 17, 18, and 19, or part of 19, is an extensive discussion of the end of one of the church's chief opponents in world history, the great prostitute, the greatest uh, corrupter in all times. Three points I want to talk about is the great prostitute described the beast upon which this great prostitute rides described in the fall of the great prostitute. Now the purpose of this is, and it's, it's a very lengthy thing. We looked at last week how it, how it started. And, and this is one of the most helpful but, but time-consuming aids to study the Bible is to truly be familiar with the Old Testament. Because especially the book of Revelation has more allusions, references, connections to the Old Testament than any other New Testament book, bar none. It's all over the place. In fact, if you want, you could actually go to Jeremiah, and well, I'm going to reference this. Jeremiah 51 is, 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 is a very long chapter that describes the destruction of Babylon on the Euphrates. And what you're going to find out is like, wow, so many parallels, so much of what John wrote here is taken from that and, 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 and structured and, and comprehended in that context, and we'll look at it. But let's look at this, the, the great prostitute. Uh, clearly, this great prostitute is a picture because uh, we know that Babylon the Great is at view. At the very last uh, uh, verse, it says, and the woman that you saw is the great city, that has dominion over the kings of the earth. This is, this is a picture of a city, and it's pictured as a great prostitute. And the question is, why? Why picture a city as a great prostitute? And the purpose is this. This is important. Sin, all sin, is the corruption of God's good gifts. 
Every sin, every ambition, every desire that we have that is sinful is the corrupting of some good gift that God has given us. And the picture in the Old Testament going on to the New Testament is this reality that one of the great pictures, one of the great blessings that God gave to man was human sexuality. A man and a wife married. That was a picture of God's good gifts. Now what happens is man jumps outside of that and corrupts it unbelievably. We live in a day and age now of sexual corruption that is beyond description. I won't talk to tell you what this, this book, this lady was reading, but this was for elementary school students. That was advocating pedophilia. And this was a book in a public school that could be checked out and was advocated by teachers for kids to read. V disgusting. And what we see here is an illustration of sin. We look at this and we are just, we're just taken back by the disgustedness of what's going on in our society. It's disgusting and horrible. But that is a picture of what man does. Man corrupts God's good gifts. And the essence of this corruption is the seduction of people away from God by whatever means. Now here, uh, Babylon the Great, as I said, is, the, is the pictured here as a prostitute. And it's the capital of the world. It is the center of all things. It says that it sits on many waters. In verse 15, the many waters that you saw the prostitute was seated on are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And then in verse 15, 18, which I read, has dominion over everything. This is an actual city that is the culmination of all the other little Babylons leading up to it. And this is the world capital. Whether it's an official capital or not, there's no doubt at, in anybody's mind at this time that this is the city of cities. No doubt. And principal to its control, central to the way in which it has gain such power and such ability is defined here as sexual immorality. Depravity, which was simply pictures of the seduction away from God by pleasure. In verse 2 in chapter 17, verse 4 in chapter 17, and then in verse eight, or chapter or 18, verse 4, it says this. It says, it talks about in verse 3 it says, For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. This is, this is the picture. This city, pictured as a prostitute, has been hell-bent on corrupting the whole world with whatever kind of pleasure is available to turn people away from God. And it is of a world class power. This capital city, this Babylon the Great, is the corrupter. It says that the prostitute in the, and the, uh, the source of the earth's abomination it is just mind-boggling. And what it does, it turns people away from God by carnal pleasures, whatever they are. And you think about our society. What drives people? If it feels good, if you only go around once in life, you've got to get all the... Okay, right? That's, that's society. If it feels good, do it. That's how we are. And what we people don't understand is that mentality, that mindset is actually satanic, and it actually pulls people away from God. It seduces them away from God. The pleasures of this world, Jesus says, does what? It crushes out the seed of the Word of God. Now, this world capital is dealing this out in spades. This, this Babylon the Great, in some way or another, is, is having an influence the entire globe over. Kings and peoples and languages and nations polluting and corrupting so that people are just like dumb animals going to the slaughter, intoxicated with pleasure. It's opulent, rich, it says, the woman, verse 4, was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Now, why that was significant, um, 
to give you an idea, remember Lydia? What was Lydia's occupation? It was a seller of purple. And you go, well, what's the big deal? Now, at that time, purple, the purple dye was only found in a, in a seashell, an animal that lived in the ocean, Mediterranean. And it would take one million of them to make one pound of dye. So we're not talking about tons and tons and pounds and pounds. So who alone could, it, could afford this dye? Only the wealthiest of people. And it was the kings who wore the purple and the scarlet, and it was an indication of their opulence. Well, here's this great prostitute. She is arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. And in her hand is a hand, a golden uh, cup. And John sees this. You see this in, in uh, the latter part of verse 8. John sees this woman, sees this vision, and she's shocked. Hey, I mean, he's shocked. It's, it's a marvelous, it's, it's truly breathtaking in its splendor. You know, if you've seen it, some, it's, just, it's weird what people wear. But this whole Met Gala thing, and people would wear these dresses, 35,000, 60,000. And the whole idea is to show off, well, it's, it's glitz and glamour. Well, she is decked out in glitz and glamour. And, and John says, wow, what in the world? Further on, describing the woman, it was aided and abetted by a scarlet beast, which we'll look at more great, more in detail. So here, get this picture. Here is this decked out prostitute, the capital of the world, sitting and riding on a scarlet beast described here full of blasphemous, blasphemous names. And we'll see that we've encountered this creature before. And it's the corrupt of the world. In verse 5 it says, and on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, and this is the mother of prostitutes. That is the source of all sorts of corruptions and of earth's abominations. Now in Hebrew, the word abomination came originally from something that is so odiferous that it's gut-wrenching. I mean, it's like at work, people, we, have, we had a refrigerator that power's been off for months. There are gnats flying on the outside. And there's stuff oozing out, flowing out of it. Pretty nasty, right? Now, what's it like when we open it up? Okay, we have to clean it out before we can... Yeah, it just, that's right. Okay, that's the idea of an abomination. Something so disgusting that it causes your stomach to just... to wrench. Well, that's what the world, that's what this prostitute is, is, is promulgating the world over. Now, it's abomination to God. You know, you, you watch right now, it's really what's really interesting. And this is, this is something to understand. How has Satan successfully got across his agenda for America, principally? In one particular example, the LGBT plus, and I just heard a new one, two. Have heard that one? That's a new one. You know what that is? Indigenous people that have two spirits. So you could have one spirit being one gender, another spirit being another gender. Okay, you just, how in the world has that been here? Not too long ago, President Clinton signed DORMA, which is the Defense of Marriage Act. And then just a few years later, the Supreme Court says no. Right now, anything and everything goes. Uh, New York is discussing uh, uh, was it po po polyamory. There is a petition for, in New York, of all places, a man wants to marry his daughter, biological daughter, I mean, it's just like, what, where did all this come from? And it comes, this is Satan's way, it comes through entertainment. If you take the time, just step back if you can and, and watch where TV has come from, where movies have. And notice how things have been injected into TV. And you know why it's so effective? How many people watch TV with their mind on? 
Huh? None. Very few people watch TV with their mind on. Uh, on. Oh, yeah, well, you're right there, yeah. But th th their mind's not, that, that's, that's a good way to put it, their mind's not, it's not on. And so they're observing, they're taking it in, and that's the culture. And this great city is, 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 is the promulgator of unbelievable abominations, stench to God, but no one thinks it. It's like, this is wonderful. We can do anything and everything we want. In Amsterdam, okay, they have plate glass windows, you know, like, you know, stores and stuff, and in it stands prostitutes soliciting their wares. This is in a city that one time was, was famous in the Reformation. This is just grotesque everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And this city is, is just pushing it out, pushing it out. And the world is taking it in, taking it in, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then at the last description is they're drunk with, she, the, the great prostitute is drunk with the blood of the saints. Just enjoys tormenting, harassing, harming, persecuting, and in many cases killing those who love and trust the Lamb. Now it comes to the next point, because this woman is not alone. She is riding a beast. Now clearly, this beast is not introduced here. It's introduced back in chapter 13, where we get the, the, the sense. And you remember, the beast in chapter 13, the beast, the Antichrist, who gave the beast its power and authority? Satan. This is, if you will, Satan's equivalent of the Christ. Satan is basically banking everything on this beast and gives everything to it. The names that it's released is the blasphemous names, because you remember what, this, what, 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 what the beast ultimately claims? What does he claim for himself? He's God. And, and the world, by, lar by and large, believes it. And why is because, and it says this here twice, and also in chapter 13, what was true of this beast? It was, it was not, and is in, in some ways to come. What is he talking about? Some kind of resuscitation. There's a mortal wound, it's described in ch chapter 13, of one of the heads of this, and it, for all the purposes, uh, attempts and purposes, it is what? Dead. Dead. And by the power of Satan, it's resuscitated. And this is so significant. This is so stressed that, that the world, because of that, look, notice what it says in verse 8. The beast that you saw is, um, it, it, that the beast you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottom of this pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers, of the, earth, uh, the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel. To see the beast, why will the we marvel to see the beast? Because it was and is not and is to come. Four reasons out here: uh, because of her size, because of her pomp, because of her show and riches, her elegance, her power. But even John marveled at her. Absolutely, you, you could. I mean, this was a splendid, vast, splendid thing. But this beast is resurrected, resuscitated. And, and the whole world, except for those written in the Lamb's Book of Life, are what? Taken up. Wow! You can't touch this. And it, this is a clear counterpoint to the resurrection of Jesus, isn't it? And what is this? They'll say this. That was a fable. It supposedly took back thousands of years ago. We know that not to be true, but we know this to be true because you folks, what? So. You saw it with your own eyes. This is God! That's what, what's going to happen. And then you go through here, and it's, it's really interesting to, to read the commentators are t discussing the, the seven heads, the seven mountains, the ten horns, all this. And one of the things that, you know, that, that, you know there's, it describes some kings that are and some coming and all this. And one of the things you find out is there's no... No consensus. There's, there's, essentially, it's something that will be clear in the future. But one of the things you, we can say this is that 
this beast supports the prostitute through a very complex and political structure. Okay. Could you say that the prostitute dominates the beast? Because you ride him, but you're going to see what takes place here. Okay? The last section here indicates something that the beast is not altogether pleased with this arrangement. Right. He resents her rulership. But the thing is, really, here is, is that the beast has a very complex and a very profound political structure. Because essentially, these kings give their authority and power and, and, and vote, if you will, to the beast. So all the while, he's working behind the scenes. He's consolidating his power. And everybody essentially is, yeah, let, we'll sign up. We're going to do it. Yes, yes, yes. And, and instead of li aligning with the great prostitute, what is the beast doing? He's getting everybody to align with him and his purposes. Her, his, his purposes aren't her purposes. Now, we see something. Look at verse 13. Let me pick at verse 12. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. To what end? Verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb. The ultimate mindset, purpose, aim of the beast is to go to war with the Lamb. And his thinking is that if he can amass enough forces, he's going to what? He's going to win some way or another. And his, he's thinking, he's plotting, and he's designing, and all of it, he's going to do this, and we're going to see that, what takes place, but we get a little glimpse of this, and, and it's like, it says this, and they will make war on the Lamb, and I like how it says this, and the, Lord, and, the Lord, and the Lamb conquers them. It's that short. This is not a protracted war. We just got out of Afghanistan in a horrific way. How long have we been there? 20 years. 20 years. How long did World War II last? But still, yeah. How long did Vietnam? I mean, I mean, we, we, we are aware of, either personally or historically, you know, there, there was one in Europe, the Hundred Year War. Okay? You know what? This is not going to be a protracted war. You understand something? This won't last a day. This won't last a day. That, just over. The lamb wins. The lamb conquers. And we'll see a little bit of the picture of that later on in chapter 19. And, and why? Because we get his credentials. This lamb, he's the Lord of lords. You, you get the highest king, the highest lord, the highest master, and he's lord of that lord, king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. The lamb wins in an instant. But this takes us to our third point. The beast and its allies turn on the great prostitute. Notice in verse uh, 16, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. In other words, he's tired of being ridden on. <laughs> he's tired of being manipulated or used for this wicked woman's purpose. Because in reality, the only reason I think that the, that, that the beast is cooperating with the great prostitute is to his ends, not hers. She's just out there living it up. And he's manipulating her. Well, I think, I think, I think he, but I think he's doing that out of his, you know, I mean, he's doing this. He's allowing this to happen because he has an agenda that she's not aware of. And at the right time, he turns on her. The powers turn on him. And the beast goes right after the great city and utterly destroys it. Now, this is amazing. Here's this great city, this powerful city, and we find, as we see, various ways in which the city's destruction is, is seen. The great earthquake in chapter 16. 
Here, the beast turns on her and he devours her flesh and rips her clothes off and burns her up. And in chapter 18, we'll see God does, does his part in all of this. Now, very importantly, is what John adds. Verse 17. Now, why? Remember, remember the statement, a house divided against itself cannot stand, right? And that Jesus said that because they accused him of casting out demons by, by demon, by Satan, and that wouldn't happen. Well, here, I, you know, I was studying this. Now, wait a minute. Isn't the great prostitute Babylon on Satan's side? Sure. Isn't the beast on Satan's side? Sure. Why in the world would then Satan attack Satan? Doesn't make good logistical sense, does it? That seems to be counterproductive, and indeed it is. Why does the beast and his allies attack the great prostitute? Boom! <laughs> That's right. Now, notice I said the secret sovereign work of God. Now, it's not really secret because it's right here, right? It's stated. But they aren't going to register. It's not going to make sense to them. The beast, in his thinking, will say, I got to get rid of this great prostitute. She's an impediment. This city is an impediment to my power. I'm going to devastate it. I'm going to destroy it. And the beast, as far as he's concerned, this is all together. And it is his own thinking, motivated by Satan. Satan's doing all this. And all the while, God says, yep, you're right on, right on schedule. You're executing precisely. Notice what it says. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out what? His purpose. By being of one mind and handing over their royal authority to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Wow. That's amazing. This convolution, this, this destruction of this city and this, this division between satanic forces and, and, and what follows is entirely and altogether exactly according to God's purpose and plan, isn't it? Now, that's important. Now, two conclusions. The first of these. Now, why in the world is John going, at, by inspiration, going at great length to describe the fall of this city. Now to do that, you have to understand, as I said, nothing is without context. Babylon in the Old Testament, we saw last week, is its birth. But Babylon was one of the chief thorns in the flesh of Israel. On three separate occasions, Babylon came and attacked Judah and Jerusalem. The final case, the final occasion, they raised the city, took a whole host of people into Babylon, and subjugated the nation. That's where Daniel, that's where um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's where Ezekiel, they all were taken out of their land and brought into this Babylon. Uh, there's a psalm. What did, the, what did the people of Babylon say to the children of Israel? Remember? Sing us a song. Come on, entertain us with your songs. And they were devastated. Now, how long were they to be in Babylon, according to Jeremiah the prophet? Seven years. So at the end of 70 years, there was a change, ultimately, to the Medes and Persians, the same city. And, and so a bunch of them went back. There were several different times when they went back. But here's the thing. There was a, a large number of Jewish exiles, people who had been taken from the land or descendants, who were extremely comfortable in Babylon. It, they had assimilated. They had become significant and accepted by society. They probably had businesses and they were doing really well. What do you mean, go back, get out? No, it's fine. Well, Jeremiah 51 is a very lengthy description of God going to destroy Babylon. Now, let's say today, we're going to get a, 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 fly, a, a, a plane, fly to Iraq, and say we want to see the bustling uh, metropolis of Babylon. And they're going to look at us like, 
You're crazy. You know why? It's a ruins. It's just archaeological dig. That's it. Well, in Jeremiah 51, God says to them, listen carefully. I am going to destroy this city, this whole nation, this whole organization that has set itself against my people. And on two occasions in here, in this, in, in Jeremiah chapter 51, he says this. In one he says, flee, get out. In another text he says, go out of her, my people. And we see that echoed in, in chapter 18, Revelation 18, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. Now what God is saying, said then, and he's saying, you must, as my people, not be part and parcel of Babylon. Because to be part and parcel of Babylon, in fact, is to be recipients of the same judgment. If you're my people, and you follow my rules, and you, you desire me, come out. Now, I think it may be actual in, in, in um, chapter 18 where come out really means physically get out. But throughout history it means to be affectionately disconnected from Babylon, from the world system. And I, I don't know if you realize how easy it is to be allured by the comforts and pleasures of this world. It is so easy. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Okay, they lied to the Holy Spirit. What did they do? So, and that's how much they donated. Yeah, and they wanted to keep the rest. What, for what purpose? To continue some sense of their lifestyle, wouldn't you think? I mean, probably if you ask the average Christian, what is the greatest fear they have of coming persecution is the loss of personal comfort. You know, we are more affected by Babylon the Great than we want to admit. And we have to come to terms with this. And God helps us to come. This world and its glitter are an allurement to the heart. But we must see what happens. What God is saying here, he says this, let me show you what the end is going to be of the Babylon the Great. Let me show you what's going to be the end of this world's organization. Let me show you what's going to be the end of the, the passions and allurements and the glitter and, the, and the, the wonder of this world. And this is it. You see this in a day wiped out. We're going to see in chapter 18, lament after lament after lament because it's over with. The scripture says don't get caught up with it. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. And we must understand that here in at chapter 18 and in Jeremiah twice, come out. You, we, you and I must really understand that we are citizens of a different city. We're pilgrims and strangers. And remember, you think about this. Why in the world would you want to cozy up to a world system that loves drinking the blood of saints? No, 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 I know that. That's a metaphor. But the point is this. Why would you want to cozy up and embrace a world system that has no intention, no good intention toward you? Seems ridiculous, doesn't it? And that's what this whole thing is. It's through the ages, it's going to culminate, and God's saying to his people throughout all ages, don't be affectionately connected locked into this world. Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. That's the first point. The second point, we're familiar with the verse in 2 Corinthians 5. How do we walk? How do we walk? Not by, but by faith. Walk by faith, not by sight. Now, think about it. What do we see? All right, look around and tell me what you see is in its present form going to last forever. Is there anything here? 
Second Peter says, what will God do with the elements? They will what? Melt with intense heat. Paul says, everything that you can see, everything you can touch, is by definition not eternal, but temporal, passing, and because of the fall, horribly disordered. C.S. Lewis calls this world Shadowlands, a, a paltry echo of reality. And what the scriptures are saying is we must not look at life or history or circumstances or anything of life by simply physical sight. By simply what we can perceive with our own human intellect. Because, back to the illustration of the basketball game, what would your eyes see? <laughs> the scoreboard. Fourth quarter, starts out, down by 42 points. You look on all, the, all your team members that are either injured out or fouled out. And if all you're seeing is with that, what are you going to do? You're going to walk away. And you know what happens if you walk away? You lose. But if you continue on, and, and in a sense, what you're doing is you're continuing on by faith. Now, we'll see that faith in this is, is fleshed out in three areas specifically. The first, faith sees the victory. I love the, the phraseology used throughout there. The saints conquer. They're victorious. They're winners. Even in many cases, that victory is is, is, is wrapped in death. You see the saints in heaven having what on their heads? And you know what those crowns are often expressive, expressive of? Victory. It's like when they had the Olympics and they ran a race and whoever won would be crowned with this uh, crown. It was an indication of victory. The heavens will be filled with victors. And constantly we are saying, you will, in fact, be victorious if you what? Persevere. If you continue on. Well, how do you continue on when the score looks like this? When everything looks so, so set against you? And it looks like it's all set against us. And, and just don't, 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 don't look and live by what you see because it's all just shadow and distorted. But look by what it is. And the first thing is this, the guarantee of the victory. Who wins? Christ wins. I got a book at home. The, the title of it is The Lamb Wins. I mean, that's cool. That's it. That's all. That's the, 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 old, the Lamb Wins. The victory is not in doubt. There is no way, what is it, that, that, what is it, uh, that defeat can snatch out of the jaws of victory. And it can't happen, no matter what it looks like. God says, I'm, I'm showing you this, that you can be absolutely assured, no matter what the score is at the end of the third quarter, no matter what the circumstances, no matter if all of a sudden right of you and left of you, saints are being killed for their faith, count on it. The victory is certain. And the only way you can see that, the only way you can act that way is have faith in what God reveals. Secondly, faith in the city. There is a stark contrast between the city, Babylon the Great, that will fall and forever be gone, ever destitute, ever void of life, and the city, New Jerusalem, that comes down from heaven. There, there, and I'll show you this. There's a ma this is deliberately here. Temporary, transient, distorted shadows versus solid, substantial, real, and eternal. What are you going to invest in? <laughs> Duh! Isn't that dumb? And th that's the point. This, the, the culmex, the pinnacle of ma man's success is going to crumble in a day. And we're going to sing a song here. It's a new one. But, but what God builds, he builds a city with his own hands that is enduring and everlasting. So the two, first thing, what is faith? The victory. Second, the city. Oh, what a city. And when we get there, I, I want us to park. It's kind of like you get a, hope none of you are vegetarians. You get a good steak, medium rare. That may offend you, but I'm sorry. Medium rare. And the taste is just, you want to, you just want, or, or a piece, I'm a, I'm a, maybe a piece of cherry pie or warm apple pie with a big glob of ice cream on it. You just want to enjoy it, don't you? 
Okay, the picture, we want it. That's, that's heaven, just an unending enjoyment of God. But the last thing, and, and really I think the most important, faith sees the Lamb. One of the favorite songs is The Sand of Time is Sinking, and it says, The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Faith sees Christ, sees the Lamb as the lion who conquers and the Lamb who was slain. Faith affixes itself on Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus. What? The author and finisher of our faith. And the next verse is, consider him who endured such contradiction. It's always looking to Jesus. And that requires the eyes of faith. Now, with faith, looking to the victory, looking to the city, and of all things, looking to the Lamb, the ultimate outcome must always be in view how we live the present. When it comes, when the tsunami uh, comes against us of persecution, hatred, and belligerence, whatever it comes, if we do not walk by, by faith and not by sight, we're in trouble. But if we do, if we have our vision properly focused on the victory, on the city, and on the Lamb, then we will not merely survive, but actually we will thrive and succeed for the cause of Christ.